Hello uh, to everyone and welcome to our workshop more neocolonial trade as a response to the war in Ukraine. Um, my name is Jeremy Oestreich. I'm working with PowerShift in Berlin on trade and investment policies, and I'm going to moderate this workshop here today. I hope uh, you have meanwhile found the translation function. Most of this workshop is going to take place in English. So I suppose if you do speak English as well, it would be the easiest for you if you just set the translation to English. If you speak English and Spanish, you can actually set the translation off completely. Otherwise, um, just use the option of the language you speak best if it is uh, German or Spanish. If you do have any technical questions or problems, please uh, contact my colleague Lilian via the chat box or email. She will try to help you then if you have any technical problems. We found it necessary to do a workshop today on trade between the global north and the global south and its neo-colonial structures within it because there has been quite some pressure by the European industry since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine to conclude trade agreements with the Mercosur region, with Chile, Mexico and Indonesia. And that pressure is actually being mirrored by politicians. Just a couple of days ago, 15 European governments urged the European Commission in a letter to double down its ambitions on the so-called free trade. And just today, the German government actually released a statement uh, with releasing the same plans. While there seems to be a certain understanding amongst social movements and the public that these trade agreements are somewhat problematic, for many, it is often hard to understand how exactly these deals are manifesting neocolonial structures of exploitation. How exactly do these trade agreements lead to more global inequality, more natural destruction and climate impact? We would like to give a general overview of the topic today in this 90 minutes workshops and try to give some insights into the problem itself and possible alternatives by having a closer look to the trade agreement between the EU and the Mercosur countries, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay. This trade deal has been negotiated since 1999 and was concluded in 2019 after 20 years of negotiations. Because of the wide public criticism, it is ever since in some sort of a limbo as it has not gone through the ratification process yet. But lately, as mentioned, there has been renewed pressure to get the agreement through the EU institutions and parliaments of member states. If the deal would be ratified, then both regions would liberalize their trade flows with each other, for example, by reducing or eliminating tariffs on imports. And we will have a look on the problematic and neocolonial aspects of that in a moment. While there is many similarities when it comes to liberalizing trade between regions of the global north and the global south, we also have to acknowledge that every region and every country is different with a different historical background as well as economic, social and cultural structures. So while we will get some perspective today on the problem in general, it is true as well that there are also many differences in other agreements between other regions which is also why there is so much literature and work being done on all the different trade agreements between different regions and all its different problematic aspects. As I suppose, many in the audience are quite new to the topic. I would like to take a very short moment to introduce the organizations that are, go uh, that are doing this work and that are co-organizing this event today. Many of the organizations that are engaged in trade policies do work on different intercorrelated subjects, but also different subjects such as human rights, indigenous rights, labor rights, democracy, environmental protection and biodiversity, climate change, health and consumer protection. One thing that brings us all together is that trade agreements as currently negotiated are a threat to all of those topics, which is why we organize in networks and address the issue of trade together. Four networks are present here today. 
First, uh, in Latin America, there is a network Latin America better without free trade agreements and network connecting the work of national platforms and organizations in all over Latin America. You can find on the website or on the Twitter account of the network um, collaborative work of the network, such as uh, the comprehensive course Free Trade in Latin America, 25 years of unfulfilled promises as well as works of national platforms and organizations. In Europe, in Europe, there is the Seattle to Brussels network, which was founded in 1999 after the World Trade Organization's Seattle ministerial meeting with the aim to challenge the corporate driven trade agenda of the European Union and European governments. On the website as well, you can find many trade related issue issues, blog posts and statements by the whole network. In Germany, there is a um, network for fair trade with many member organizations being core organizers here today. And in Austria, in Austria, there is the Trade Differently Network working on trade as well as other economic issues such as corporate power and labor. Also, we formed a coalition of 450 civil society organizations from both sides of the Atlantic to hold the EU Mercosur deal, which shows again the wide agreement among civil society organizations that this agreement would be harmful for very many different reasons. On the website of that uh, of our coalition, you can find a petition to sign and material uh, specifically on the EU Mercosur trade agreement in many different languages. So if you are looking for information or an organization working on trade in your specific country or region, or if you want to organize a workshop or a conference and you need speakers for it, do, do feel free to contact these networks. They are very happy to help you out with contacts and further information. For our workshop today, I'm very grateful that we have three very experienced researchers, activists and experts on trade here with us. There's uh, Teresa Koffler. She is the coordinator of the Austrian Trade Differ Differently Network. She will start off with a view on why states actually negotiate these deals and explain the undemocratic and corporate friendly agenda behind them. Then second, we have Marita Gonzalez, Gonzalez with us. She is a social scientist and researcher focusing on trade unionism and labor, being part of the General Confederation of Labor in Argentina and a member of the Argentinian monitoring platform for the Agenda 2030. She will give us an overview of how EU Mercosur would lead to more global inequalities and economic asymmetries between the two regions. Finally, we have Luciana Giotto with us. She is the coordinator of the network Latin America Better Without Free Trade Agreements and researcher at the Transnational Institute. She will show us the consequences of those economic shifts for the environment, for the climate and human rights. After each input by the three speakers, we will have a few minutes of questions. So if you do have direct questions, if there are things you didn't understand, please do ask your question and best do that in the Q&A box, uh, which will make it much more easier for, for me to, to distinguish between technical questions. Please do ask them in the chat to, uh, to Lilian and the content related question. It would be very helpful if you use the Q&A box for that. Thank you. And Later in the workshop, we will go into breakout, uh, breakout rooms. So um, if you do have uh, like more um, broader questions or you want to discuss uh, some things, please do take those things into the breakout rooms. There will be more time and space to discuss those. Now I will hand over the word to Theresa, um, who will start off, uh, uh, start off our workshop here today and explain why states actually negotiate these deals and why they are so undemocratic and corporate friendly. Uh, Theresa, you have the word. Thank you, Jeremy, um, and thank you for the invitation. I'm super excited to be here today and uh, to have a little different take to um, the sometimes um, yeah, technical trade issues that are actually highly relevant for um, yeah, the future that we want. Um, so I'm going to talk first a little bit about the promises of trade liberalization. Um, 
there is mostly two. There's an economic promise, there's a political promise, there are also cultural promises, um, and then have a look at how those got captured. Um, so the main argument that is actually quite old already, why um, states want to liberalize their trade is the idea that it would rise general prosperity if every region produced what they're best at. So what's the idea behind that? It actually makes sense to some extent, right? So for example, Colombia could be better at producing coffee than at producing cheese, whereas Switzerland is better at producing cheese than at producing coffee. And it would be pretty complicated for Switzerland to build all the greenhouses and to need all the water and all the heat to produce coffee in Switzerland. So that's the general idea. What's the flaw though? The flaw is that for some reasons um, or some of these reasons why countries are better at something than others are not really fair and not really understandable um, and should not maybe be kept by that. So, for example, if we look back at the Colombia or Switzerland example, another thing that uh, Switzerland produces is chocolate, right? So we all know Swiss chocolate, but they don't have cocoa plants growing there. So that's because for some reason, or <laughs> the reasons uh, many of us know, transnational corporations have, have uh, succeeded in bringing the raw materials to Switzerland and then producing the chocolate there and then gaining the profit from the chocolate that they sell, right? So if that were kept like that forever, that the countries where the cocoa grows kept only growing the cocoa and countries like Switzerland that have the an historic advantage would always sell chocolate, that wouldn't be fair and that would definitely increase the global inequality that we have and um, that we are already seeing and that is some um, due to colonial, a colonial history, right? Um, and additionally to that logic, another problem, for example, is that Lindt or basically any chocolate company wants to pay low prices for the cocoa. So that makes the working conditions bad, it makes environmental conditions bad, um, and that leads to less movement for development, for choosing own development paths, um, or even post-development paths in the countries where these raw materials or the cocoa in that case come from. Um, so altogether, the promise was that the prosperity for every region would rise um, if we did what we are all best at. That is only true for some. So some regions, some corporations, some sectors can benefit from trade liberalization, but that is definitely not guaranteed. And history has shown us, there's many examples of that, um, that instead of prosperity for all, more trade actually leads to more exploitation of people and nature of climate. And that all goes hand in hand with trade liberalization. Um, so that was the economic promise. Um, there is also a political promise that many of you, I guess, have heard about a lot, especially in the last couple of months. And that is that countries that trade don't start wars. So what's the idea behind that? Um, the idea is that if one country trades with another, there is an economic interest behind that. Um, so it's less likely or it should be less likely to bomb another country that you trade with because then you would lose out in the end of that too, right? Um, and additionally, trade can go hand in hand with social relations, with knowing people, um, with having offices someplace else. So that would also make it um, more difficult to start a war with that country. That's the idea. Um, what's the flaw? Uh, the flaw is that that is a theory that is pretty hard to prove um, and it's never guaranteed either. So there are examples like the European Union where very strong trading and very strong economic interdependence has led so far to no more wars on the European continent. Um, but on the other hand, there is many, many other cases of interstate wars where at some point geopolitical concerns or questions of national security rise that outweigh the economic benefits of trade. And it's actually pretty easy to see because there's hardly any countries who do not trade at all, um, but still there's interstate wars, right? Um, 
So that political premise of peace, we can also say, unfortunately, has not been completely kept, although, of course, it's a nice thought and a nice idea. Um, so for both promises, um, we unfortunately have to say that always um, they're not kept 100%, uh, and there is always winners and losers. Um, so especially amongst the winners are usually big transnational corporations because they know how to maneuver that system. They have offices in different places, they are big enough, they do speak the languages, they know how to handle that. Whereas um, small farmers, small fishers, workers, the coffee producers, um, the milk producers, a lot of people who are not already interlinked in transnational corporations do not know how to handle these systems and they are the ones who will eventually be losing out. Um, and in addition to not having the capacities to really profit from um, working transnationally. Um, another big advantage that transnational corporations have is that they know how to use the system. They know how to lobby. They know how to use the intransparency that negotiation processes often have. And these two, the lobbying and the intransparency are usually the two central problems of why those interests get put on the front line when trade agreements are negotiated. And as Jeremy already told you, um, the example that we're going to work with for the rest of the day is the EU Mercosur agreement. And we have there recently published a study on how the car industry, the European car industry, influenced the agreement. And what we can very clearly see is that in terms of the things that um, in the end will be traded, there is a lot of interests of the car industry that are being met. Um, so for example, a lot of raw materials um, that are used for cars will be cheaper for the European industry if that agreement um, ever got uh, ratified. Um, the same is true, for example, for leather, that, um, the need for the car seats or for biofuels, um, soy or sugar that will be or that can be made to biofuels in um, in the European Union. And on the other hand, um, it's going to be cheaper for the European Union or industries in the European Union to export cars and parts of cars um, to the Mercosur region. Most of them will even be still fossil driven cars. So that is all behind the background of fossil cars being phased out in Europe, but then still being exported for another decades or more um, into other regions of the world. And that has to do a lot with direct lobbying by the car industry, but it also has a lot to do, especially in the case of Germany, by, for example, the economic ministry directly going to the car industry and asking them what their wishes are. So they don't even have to be all um, yeah, sneaky about uh, going to Brussels and then having backroom deals and backroom meetings. They even get asked by the German ministry what they want. Um, and I doubt, <laughs> and there is also no direct proof or evidence that the German ministry asked, for example, their bike lobby what they wanted or the, any other more sustainable businesses what they wanted. Um, the same is true for, of course, that um, yeah, other interest groups, for example, consumer groups or climate groups have much less direct access to these um, agreements, to these negotiations. We also always have a problem of not knowing what is actually being negotiated. So, for example, at this point, um, <clears throat> The European Commission has heard a lot of critique from civil society that this is not climate friendly, that this is against workers' rights, that a lot of indigenous groups will be suffering from the agreement. And now what they have been saying for about two years actually is, yeah, we're going to work on it. But they give us zero evidence how they're actually doing that. We do not know if they talk every week. We do not know if they have talked in the last six months. And um, they don't give any insights on what is being discussed or what timeline there is. And um, so this is highly problematic because there is hardly any public knowledge on what is happening. Um, 
only for those who either get asked directly or who have the power and the resources to go and ask uh, themselves, which a lot of groups, of course, don't have. Um, so in that sense, um, there's a lot of horrific consequences for the climate, for the ecosystem, for workers, for indigenous communities and many others. Um, yeah, and the uh, two economic promises are the economic premise mainly, and um, we can already say that this agreement will not lead to prosperity for all. There's definitely going to be winners and losers. The winners are going to be big corporations in both regions, and the losers are going to be all the small group um, companies and workers and consumers and things. Um, as for the political promise, we will have to see, um, hopefully, um, there won't be any wars between the two regions either way. Um, yes, and I'm going to stop here because my two, uh, the two speakers after me will go into much more detail about the agreement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Theresa. Um, and also, yeah, thanks for highlighting the power problem of the big corporations, especially with the example of the of the car industry. I think that was um, makes it very uh, vivid uh, for us. And it also kind of uh, relates to the question which has already been asked. Um, it is a little bit a broader question on how we can uh, network more uh, internationally and take the power by the um, powerful corporations uh, to bring about more re regional trade. Um, I, I would um, suggest that we take that into the breakout session later. And I know for sure that Theresa is also um, working a lot on uh, regionalization. So if you want to discuss that as a possible solution, let's take it, let's take it into the breakout session and discuss it there. Um, if you do have like um, things you don't understand or so, please ask a question in the Q&A box as there is none so far, no, no other questions. I um, suggest we go on with um, Marita Gonzalez, who will give us now an overview of how EU Mercosur would lead to more global inequalities and economic asymmetries between the two regions. Marita, you have the word. Sí, buenas tardes. Creo que tienen que cambiar a español. Eh, buenas tardes y buenas noches para, para Europa. Eh, bueno, muchas gracias por, por la invitación. Eh, y, y en principio, uno de los temas que, que uno se podría plantear es cómo abordar esto en, en 20 minutos, lo cual es bastante difícil. Pero básicamente lo que uno lo primero que puede decir es que el acuerdo, como se dijo aquí, se inició las primeras rondas de negociaciones y, de, y, y, y ofertas, se realizaron entre el año 95 y 99 y se oficializó eh, la, la mesa de negociaciones en 1999 y efectivamente estuvo con unos periodos que son de estancamiento, periodos de aceleración. Eh, periodos de, de dificultades, eh, ya sea por el lado europeo o por el lado del de Mercosur, pero principalmente lo que se observa en estos 24 años que llevó de negociación es que la Unión Europea en particular avanza cuando ve que Estados Unidos nuevamente se acuerda de que tiene el patio trasero y que sobre todo Mercosur eh, que son los países como más fuertes de, de América del Sur, eh, pueden ser eh, tomados más el comercio por Estados Unidos. Entonces hay una puja ahí geopolítica, más allá de las multinacionales, que es importante tener en cuenta, porque el, el proceso se inicia en 1994, justamente cuando se inicia el proceso de la Cumbre de las Américas, que quería tener como resultado el ALCA, y que finalmente no, no fue posible, no, se fracasó en el año 2005. Cuando fracasan en el 2005, se paralizan también las negociaciones Unión Europea-Mercosur. Y se reactivan cuando se da la crisis a partir del 2008, eh, en los países centrales, con un impacto muy fuerte en el empleo, muy fuerte en la industria europea y norteamericana, y 
en América del Sur, esa crisis del 2008 recién va a empezar a visualizarse en el 2010. Esto es importante decirlo, es que siempre aparece una reacción de la Unión Europea y siempre una idea muy de colonialismo interno, y eso nos convoca Jeremy y todo el grupo de trabajo en, en, este, en este taller, en este intercambio, a pensar desde la perspectiva neocolonial, ¿no es cierto? Hay una perspectiva neocolonial en la cual nosotros en América del Sur tenemos como representantes eh, del neocolonialismo a estas empresas, como decía Teresa, multinacionales, pero también a las multinacionales alimenticias de América del Sur que eh, creen que puede ser positivo. El acuerdo se, eh, se aceleró entre el 2016 y el 2019, luego de, una, de, de un proceso bastante conflictivo en, el, en los años anteriores, y quiero plantear algunos de los elementos o dejar sentado algunos de los elementos de por qué este acuerdo es lesivo, este acuerdo es nocivo para el Mercosur y también lo es para la Unión Europea. En primer lugar es porque hay este intercambio que decía Teresa entre el café y el, el chocolate en Suiza, eh, no es tan así en el Mercosur y Unión Europea, porque ha sido muy limitado el acceso al mercado de bienes agrícolas que la Unión Europea le otorgó a el Mercosur. De hecho es el mismo porcentaje, digamos la misma cantidad de toneladas de carne, de diversas carnes, digamos, que había establecido en el 2010 cuando se paralizaron las, eh, el acuerdo, cuando el acuerdo entró en un momento de, de freezer, de enfriamiento. Eh, con lo cual se sigue con, la, con la, el mercado de bienes y productos alimenticios procesados, eh, resguardados para la Unión Europea. Entonces, este intento de decir que se va a vender más, no lo vemos, o sea, de, 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 desde la perspectiva del mercado de bienes, no lo vemos. La segunda es la distorsión del comercio agrícola por los subsidios europeos. Las reducciones proteccionistas que tiene Europa, que van mucho más allá de... Eh, que son, digamos, incluso contrarias a las políticas de la Organización Mundial del Comercio, por la política agrícola común de la Unión Europea, por ejemplo, para el periodo 2014-2020, la PAC, la Política Agrícola Europea, sí, de la Unión Europea, cuenta con un presupuesto que es de 360 mil millones de euros, eso es el 80% del Producto Bruto Interno de la Argentina. Entonces, claramente es muy difícil competir en materia agrícola con esa cantidad de subsidios, y por lo tanto, si bien ha habido concesiones, no es cierto que se abren eh, posibilidades agrícolas. Luego está la cuestión que vamos a a definir, como decía Teresa, respecto a cuál es el impacto ambiental en eso, el impacto para el, el desarrollo de los ecosistemas terrestres. Pero además de eso, no es cierto, no, no hay una promesa cumplida por parte de la Unión Europea. Esto afecta a muchos productos, por ejemplo, de, de Mercosur, porque se, hay cierre vinculado al tema de la leche, los derivados de la leche, que Teresa lo explicaba muy bien, el trigo, la harina de trigo, la carne bovina, las porcinas, los aviares, quiere decir que efectivamente eh, es un acuerdo neocolonial, porque en realidad la mayor parte de las eh, posiciones ofensivas de la Unión Europea fueron consideradas a favor de la Unión Europea. Luego hay una, eh, tenemos un periodo de gracia que para la reconversión, esto que Teresa planteaba en el sector automotriz, que es muy corto para países que no están, que no están desarrollados, porque el periodo es de 10 años, quiere decir que es muy en, en promedio. Además, impide, por ejemplo, algunos instrumentos de política industrial eh, que tiene el Mercosur, en particular Brasil y Argentina, 
para lo que llamamos industrias nacientes. Entonces, si estos países quieren eh, hacer un proceso de industrialización, van a ser claramente obstaculizados con este acuerdo. Y aquí hay un, una, una diferencia entre lo que ocurre con los países del norte y con los países del sur, lo que reclaman los países del sur, y en particular la sociedad civil del sur, es lo que llamamos transición justa respecto a eh, un, un ecosistema eh, sostenible, un desarrollo sostenible. Y es que si los países del norte han desarrollado industrialmente y han contaminado durante 400 años, digamos, sus responsabilidades son diferenciadas respecto a los países en vías de desarrollo. Además, tenemos otro punto que es la regla de origen, y en la regla de origen, la Unión Europea solicitó a, a lo largo de todo el proceso de negociación que nos adecuáramos al régimen de origen de la Unión Europea, que significa que es el régimen de origen es la cantidad digamos, de insumos de la Unión Europea, que es un promedio del 5%, para que ese producto, cada producto, sea considerado europeo. En el caso del Mercosur, nuestro régimen de origen promedio es del 20%. A partir del acuerdo va a ser del 5%. ¿Y por qué es esto? Porque la Unión Europea actualmente, por ejemplo en el sector textil, en el sector plástico, es en realidad tiene muy poco de componente europeo. La mayor parte se produce, ustedes lo saben, en países donde los derechos laborales no, digamos, no existen, como por ejemplo el sector textil en Zimbabue. Y entonces lo que va a haber aquí es una triangulación, entonces productos que son elaborados en países que son, no son de la Comunidad Europea, que no tienen derechos laborales, que no tienen salud y seguridad, que no están siendo eh, analizados de la perspectiva ambiental, digamos, como ha sido el procesamiento de esos productos y que van a ser etiquetados en Europa y que van a ingresar con arancel cero al Mercosur. Eso es altamente lesivo para industrias como la industria del cuero, la industria del zapato en Brasil y las industrias textiles, particularmente la más pequeña que es la de Paraguay y la de Argentina. Pero además, por ejemplo, en lo que hace a venta, voy a dar un ejemplo que es el ejemplo del arroz, muy, muy parecido al ejemplo del café que daba Teresa. La Unión Europea no permitió el ingreso del arroz, digamos, de que nos estuviera dentro del proceso de negociación. El problema es que nuestro arroz no es igual al arroz carnaroni que se usa en la Unión Europea. Se conoce como el arroz largo, se utiliza para otros tipos de comidas. Sin embargo, esa es la mayor exportación, por ejemplo, de Paraguay. Bueno, no ingresó al mercado. Y eso significa una restricción para Paraguay. Y esto tratando de no hablar solo con ejemplos argentinos, sino también de nuestros colegas eh, de los otros países. La liberalización de los servicios públicos. Las compras gubernamentales, ¿a qué le llamamos compras gubernamentales? La, el mayor comprador no es solamente entre multinacionales. El Estado, cuando hace compras de gobierno, ¿sí? en un municipio pequeño, en los pequeños pobladores o en las grandes urbes, en las grandes metrópolis, el mayor comprador es el Estado, por la obra pública, por las escuelas, por el sistema de salud, lo vimos con el COVID-19. Bueno, ahí, digamos, tenían preferencia los proveedores del Mercosur. Si este acuerdo entra en vigencia, va a tener igual tratamiento los proveedores de la Unión Europea. Y la historia cuenta que en otros acuerdos, como por ejemplo con Corea o con Centroamérica, los proveedores de la Unión Europea suelen ganar el 97% de las licitaciones públicas donde se presentan. Esto significa que no hay posibilidades para los proveedores del Mercosur, competir con la Unión Europea. Así que ahí me parece que es importante definir que eso va a reducir el empleo y va a reducir el desarrollo sostenible. 
Lo mismo ocurre con la extensión de patentes medicinales, que si bien hay un acuerdo de que se eh, adopte el sistema de derechos de propiedad intelectual que ha dado la Organización Mundial del Comercio, eh, Europa insta a que haya una extensión de las patentes medicinales, y nosotros sabemos que eso tiene que ver con la, el poderío de los laboratorios de la Unión Europea. Eso afecta directamente, en este caso, a la Argentina, que es el sexto productor de bienes medicinales. ¿sí? Tiene 140 laboratorios y que no pueden competir con la Unión Europea. Después tiene que ver con las indicaciones geográficas, que ustedes lo saben, son bebidas espirituosas, eh, eh, plantas, vegetales, ¿sí? productos como eh, quesos que tienen determinados nombres y que tenemos que readaptarnos. Sé que estoy en, en tiempo y forma, pero quiero decir que hay un, un elemento central que sé que lo va a contar Luciana porque lo cuenta mucho mejor, que es el sistema de pesca. Y en el caso de, de pesca me parece que es muy importante saber por qué nosotros trabajamos con el concepto de, eh, digamos, de dónde se pesca, es decir, el producto dónde es pescado, efectivamente, de, y, y eso no es el caso de la Unión Europea, que lo plantea con los barcos factorías, y ya tenemos ese problema, la mayor, la mayor parte de los productos de mariscos y pescados que consume la Unión Europea están extraídos de los mares del sur, pero no pagan, digamos, lo, las regalías correspondientes. Quiere decir que en esos lineamientos es donde se da el impacto en el ecosistema, en los mares, que es el ODS 14 dentro de la Agenda 2030, el, el mantenimiento de los mares, ¿sí? la posibilidad de la biodiversidad, pero también en el empleo. Y eso provoca generalmente el problema que hoy tenemos y que está vinculado al tema de mayores migraciones laborales. Entonces creo que hay, tenemos que ver las cuestiones de forma integral. Y finalmente, para no extenderme, quiero decir que el, el problema de esta relación asimétrica tiene que ver cómo concebimos a la civilización capitalista. Porque la civilización capitalista ha sido siempre pensada desde la mirada de Leonardo da Vinci, de ese hombre eh, de Vitrulio, que es antropocéntrica, mirada desde la mirada del hombre como centro del universo. Y los pueblos del sur, particularmente nuestra América Andina, nos ha enseñado que en realidad el mundo es cosmocéntrico, que necesitamos desarrollar una mirada mucho más eh, integral entre el ecosistema y el desarrollo sostenible de las personas. Así que bueno, con eso quería cerrar y muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Marita. Um, as there are no questions, I would uh, suggest we directly go on to Luciana, and Luciana will now show us the consequences of those economic shifts uh, by the agreement for the environment, the climate, and human rights. Okay, good afternoon. I was asked to speak in English, so I will go in English. Uh, thanks for the invitation first. Um, second, I will say that Marita was saying that I will talk about fisheries. I won't, <laughs> because I was asked to, to talk actually uh, on what Jeremy was saying. That, that is more related, uh, and I wanted to bring this discussion, that is uh, related to the effects of uh, free trade On, uh, when we think about Mercosur EU, but not only, I want to bring also some of the experiences that we have in Latin America related to the trade policy that the European Union has been developing in the last years. And so uh, talk a, a bit about what, what Marita was saying, that it's the effect of, of uh, the trade agenda on the global south. Um, first of all, I will start with a hypothesis that we work on, that is the idea that When we see these trade agreements, as, as Teresa and also Marita were, were explaining, um, I could summarize that saying that what we talk about with, with the trade agenda is about an asymmetric trade relation. And actually what trade agreements come to do is to actually put a chain or let's say, yeah, a lock, 
a lot on uh, these differences of uh, international labor division, that is the global south being the countries or the part of the world that supplies all the products that have been explained before. So I will, I will take advantage of being the third, the third one to speak. Um, many examples have been given uh, on how the global south has been actually um, specializing on the production. It's not actually production, on extraction. So when we listen about this word of extractivism, it's a word that we use a lot in Latin America, and it actually is very interesting to understand the situation of how uh, production is made in our countries. Trade relations with the European Union has actually um, deepened extractivism in Latin America. We can see that not only in Mercosur EU uh, agreement that we are sure that the consequences will be as Marita was explaining, but we can see that also in other um, trade agreements that were built with other, uh, for example, in Latin America, with other countries of the region, like Peru, like Colombia, like Ecuador, Chile, of course, also. So the Latin American countries and the global South in general, if we see African countries, I think that we can actually talk about the same experience, is uh, countries that have actually specialized in the production of, of raw materials extracted from the fields, from the oceans, from under soil, so we, we talk about minerals, we talk about oil and gas, um, we talk about different kinds of fruits, the, uh, coffee, chocolate, uh, we talk, well, no, it's cacao, it's actually it's not chocolate because some of the chocolate, as it, Teresa was saying before, is produced in the European Union, but all the seeds come from the uh, Equatorian uh, countries, which are actually the ones that produce this kind of, this kind of products. So what we see is that these agreements will actually put um, a lock, I was saying, on any possibility of having new policies related to industrialization for the, the global south. So what these agreements do is that they guarantee the access to these raw materials from the global south. Now we see that also, for example, from the, uh, for the energy transition process in the European Union that is really pressing because of civil society pressure being put on the countries and the European Commission in the past years, which is great. But we also know that the European Union is now pressing also for the access to energy and raw materials, which is actually one of the new chapters included in the negotiations, for example, with New Zealand, with Indonesia, also with Chile and with Mexico. We see that um, the renegotiations of the old, of the old agreements of 1999 and 2000 uh, include now these chapters where actually the, the, um, the main purpose of these trade agreements is for the European corporations to have access to, for example, lithium. So we have a, a huge range of products from uh, what we would call raw materials from, for example, Latin American countries that actually are going to the European Union. And the balance is when we see that the assessment or the general um, studies that show the effects of 10 years, for example, there have, um, we have 10 years of the uh, Peru-European Union agreement this year, uh, we see that the, the impact has been exactly as was expected. This um, deepening of these extractivist policies in the global south, in this case in Peru, for example, and of course um, the export from the European Union to our countries related to uh, materials, uh, to pro products related to uh, medium and high, high level of technology. So for example, and, and Marita was saying, when we look at the, at the trade relation, for example, between the European Union and Mercosur, what we find is exactly this, as Marita was saying, we find that from the main uh, products that go from Mercosur to the EU, we have soy, we have wood pulp, we have iron ore, uh, coffee, orange juice, and of course, um, uh, what is related to uh, meat, right? Meat, as, as has been said before, we have different types of meat that is actually one of the sectors that is actually going to be the one that um, is going to be benefited from Mercosur Europe EU agreement. Um, but then when we see from the EU what comes to the Mercosur countries, we see medicines, vaccines, planes, uh, vessels, we see helicopters, we see uh, cars, 
a parts of cars. So we see exactly what we were saying, that is the products that have this medium and, um, and high level of technology. So the, the agreements, what they actually do is, as I was saying before, they put this lock. They guarantee that this asymmetry is going to actually uh, continue in time. And of course, this has uh, territorial impacts. When we look, uh, not only from an economic point of view, or we look at the, uh, the, uh, the trade asymmetries from a, an economic point of view, we'll see all these products coming and going. But then we have to see what the effects are on the territories. This is one of the topics that is probably the, the one that has been most discussed, especially related to the fires in the Amazon and all the, um, the new frontier that has been uh, moving forward related to having these huge uh, fields specially made for soy, uh, soy plantation and also for uh, meat for cows actually for cows being able to, to develop in, in those area in, in Brazil, but not only in Brazil. That is something that we have to show the European civil society that we have been discussing with people from, for example, from different attacks in, in uh, attack network in, in Europe is that we know that one of the main topics is the Amazon, but this is not only about the Amazon. So we have the impacts that are related to other regions in the, in the Mercosur countries that of course uh, go beyond the Amazon, which of course is maybe what we, got, we have seen as the biggest, um, the, well, it's the most spectacular, spectacular picture, right? To have uh, showing the pictures of the Amazon in fire. But in Argentina, for example, or in, in, or in Paraguay, we have big regions that are also uh, forests that have been uh, deforestated in order to grow soy and to and to have cows uh, in those areas and these are the sectors that are actually going to have a benefit from the agreement in the mercosur countries so it's not only that um, we will have industrial sectors affected that as marita was saying we will have these sectors that will be affected and this will have a huge impact on on employment but also there are winners on the mercosur side and that has to be said very clearly on the Mercosur side, also on the, on the other countries of the region of Latin America, the, the ones that benefit are the groups that have been uh, concentrated, related especially to the production of raw materials and export also. So these big corporations are the ones that actually control the whole change of production. They own the, the fields and the cows, and they control the, the, the system where these are, uh, they go to the big uh, fridges where, from where they are exported to China or to the European Union, for example. So these corporations are actually the ones that are going to be benefited from the agreement. Um, what is the impact on, on, on the territories? Well, the territories, there is this concept that is very interesting and this you can, you can trace in every trade agreement is the, the concept of sacrifice zone. We have the zones that have been left, uh, or they are understood as areas where production is especially for exporting. So for example, we have this not only in, in the cases of where, that I was talking about regarding the deforestation and the fires in the forests related to the soy plantations and also on the, on the areas related to, to the cows, but also we have, for example, Colombia and Ecuador have specialized in producing uh, broccoli and cauliflower for export. And you would say, well, it's good to produce cauliflower and, and, bro and broccoli because they are very good vegetables for your health. But the problem is that uh, the way that these products, these good and healthy products and, 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 and food related uh, to, um, products are produced, they are produced for exporting. And so they use a huge amount of water, for example, in this case. So in the southern part of Colombia and the northern part of, of Ecuador, what we see is these areas that have been behaving as, as um, sacrifice zones where people produce these products, but only to be exported. And that is what we are seeing everywhere. So what we are seeing not only in, in the regions where we have, uh, for example, as Marita was saying, she was talking about the textile sector, or we can talk about the technological sector, the different sectors of, of production in different countries where we see the chain and we see the states creating these 
these uh, zones made especially for producing products for exporting. But we see that also in a prime, um, no, sorry, in raw material pr production. We see that in vegetable productions. We see that in minerals production. We see that, for example, in the production of, of cow meat, of, of bovine meat. Um, so what we have here is that trade is related directly the global global markets and trade as a as a, as a tool for as I was saying before locking these asymmetries of trade between the big countries and the global south create these uh, sacrifice zones in our countries which are actually a big a big big problem for the um, for the indigenous groups but also for populations that live near near uh, near these areas for example. Um, only one only one piece of information before I, I finish. Um, for example, the glyphosate use in Brazil is 10 times bigger than in the European Union. So we have big campaigns in Brazil and in Argentina also of uh, social movements and different types of, of organizations that actually are against the use of glyphosate and uh, they denounce the way that uh, all the economic system in, in Argentina has been relying on the use of glyphosate, which actually has uh, intense um, consequences on health and on the environment. So this can be also, for example, all the central part of Argentina and the central part of Brazil too could be understood also as sacrifice zones where people are actually uh, breathing and drinking glyphosate uh, every day in their lives when a uh, while while in the European Union, uh, the use of glyphosate is prohibited in many countries. So this uh, asymmetry is also something that we are seeing and the consequences, it's important for, for the um, European movements to know that the consequences of the system is usually relying or, or it, it falls on the, on the small locations and the small groups of, of people that actually are near the areas where these products are produced and this is something that has to be has to be uh, denounced has to be talked about and also included in the different campaigns that we that we work on that's all thank you thank you so much luciana um there's no questions in in the box i i would like to make sure maybe one thing um is clear i'm not i'm not too sure if we have come to that point yet. Um, so Theresa has, has talked about um, the, the um, um, oh, I'm missing the word, but anyways, uh, later Luciana, you, you say that these asymmetric trade relations and uh, the extractivism is actually locked in by these trade agreements. And, and Marita, you have said also that it is a, a problem for the industri industrial uh, development in, in the Mercosur region. So one one central part of these agreements is to uh, get rid of barriers to trade right there should be more trade so for example tariffs should be eliminated or at least reduced and there's other trade barriers which should be eliminated eliminated could one of you three maybe pinpoint to the reason how does taking barriers to trade away how does that actually uh, lock in this asymmet asymmetric uh, trade relations, just to make sure that that this is uh, come over in this uh, uh, workshop. J just who wants to speak? Luciana, ¿qué estás vos? Sí. Sí, sí. Very short. Um, no, that it's important to say that these agreements, of course, are not only about tariffs. All the trade agreements uh, have maybe in between 25 and 35 chapters plus thousands of pages of, of annexes. And we're talking about, as it was said before, a huge set of uh, rules and regulations in different types of trade related measures and areas. One of those areas has to do with uh, trade but not only. So we have a lot of pressure being set right now, especially, and one of, of the topics that is usually probably of importance to you, is that one of, of the areas that is beyond trade, but it has to do with uh, regulation of, of uh, what is called uh, obstacles to trade, um, barriers to trade, is uh, exactly, for example, the precautionary principle. 
that is something that is being pushed inside the Mercosur EU agenda, especially when we take into account that Brazil and Argentina have had a very offensive, aggressive position in WTO, for example, against the, pre the precautionary principle inside the European Union. This means that um, for the Europeans, this will mean exactly uh, lowering the standards for what you eat, for what you drink, for uh, all the, um, the different products that get to your table. So this is something important. I mean, I, I would love to, I always say, uh, Marita has heard me saying that, but I, I would love Mercosur countries to have a precautionary principle such as that, because it would, it would mean that it, um, um, using trade Using trade as an excuse, actually, what the European is, uh, Union is doing as a, uh, in a protectionist way, is actually protecting also the consumers, people there. So this is something that I would like to have on the Mercosur countries. But no, the, 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 the effect of Mercosur EU will be exactly the opposite. It will be Argentina and Brazil pushing and putting, putting a lot of pressure on the precautionary principle. And that is actually something that the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Argentina said when the, the, um, the agreement was actually uh, came to, to an end, the negotiations came to an end, he said exactly that. He said, we have had, we have got an agreement that is actually going to allow the science being over the precautionary principle in the European Union. So this is what we're going to be seeing. So the asymmetry, and I close with this, the, the, the trade asymmetries uh, will deepen and the regulatory asymmetries will actually shorten. So um, what we will have is the European Union regulations being closer to Mercosur regulation, which is actually non-existent on, on the things that we eat and what we drink and the air we breathe every day. So we're full of glyphosate. So th that is like a, a, an entrance, like an introduction to the topic. Thank you very much. Um... So the idea would be now um, to go into breakout sessions and to discuss things further. I think like uh, either our audience knows already so much uh, or wants to discuss uh, more deep questions. So um, it's a good way for us to go. Um, um, the idea would be if you have, um, like if you wanna discuss uh, concepts or ideas or if anything has been unclear so far, to discuss that in the uh, breakout session with one of our uh, three speakers. Um, also, the idea would be that we find uh, solutions and talk about uh, alternatives in those breakout sessions. So we will go into three breakout rooms by link. Welcome back, everyone. Maybe I can start by asking uh, Teresa, um, would you start off and uh, would you present or a person from your group? Um, yes, I can start. Okay. Um, so we've had a very interesting discussion, especially on what does it take to make trade a bigger issue again, um, since it is uh, politically and economically very relevant, but has not been so um, prominent in general discourse or also on the streets compared to and uh, maybe TTIP and CETA times, also the times when the WTO must, was more under critique. Um, and one of the things that came up was to look in a lot of detail at the agreements and then point out, I found it very interesting that um, CETA has, a, um, has one sentence on uh, cemeteries should stay public. So, where does that come from exactly? And why do we have to state that? Um, so that I found that very interesting. Um, and then also link it to more, uh, like Luciana also said, there is the whole debate on energy transition. How does that link to trade agreements? There is a debate on mobility transition. How does that link to trade agreements? And then bring, for example, um, a demand on stop these trade agreements into the discourse on the streets and things like that. Um, and then we also state that regional, more regional production is definitely um, the way to go, but th that will need a lot of add-ons such as it should be ecological, it should be social. There's a lot of considerations in terms of what, what does it do to uh, countries that are interdependent at the moment? How can we make trust transitions there? Um, yes, so I think that was the 
the basic gist of our uh, discussion and also one final um, at uh, the energy charter treaty debate has been very uh, um yeah very uh, present this week and it's going to be one, a chance to actually do that and bring debates on trade and energy together um so when those um results come out uh, it will be an opportunity for us to speak out about it i hope i didn't forget anything yeah <laughs> Cool, thank you very much, Theresa. Um, let's maybe continue. Um, Marita, do, do you want to um, present what has been discussed in your group? Um, sí. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, nosotros debatimos básicamente algunos elementos que también había proporcionado Luciana, así que ha sido muy, muy interesante la, la exposición, vinculados eh, eh, en primer lugar a algunos ejemplos, ¿no es cierto? Se, se, se enfatizó, por ejemplo, en el caso del de acuerdo de Unión Europea con, con Ecuador, que ya lleva seis años de aplicación y que efectivamente eh, eso incrementó. Eh, fundamentalmente las exportaciones de brócoli y de flores, pero que eh, no se tiene ningún recaudo en materia de agroquímicos, que se sigue rociando, impactando en la salud laboral, pero también en los consumidores, que no hay regulaciones de lo que se está eh, exportando, que era un poco a lo que nos invitaba a hacer pensar Luciana, respecto a que efectivamente... Ah, puede haber regulaciones en Europa, pero los acuerdos no, no están contemplando esas regulaciones de principios precautorios, ¿no? como decía Luciana. Eh, y también se habló del tema de, de la precarización de las cadenas de valor eh, en la terciarización, por ejemplo, cómo los productores de flores eh, más importantes, las corporaciones más grandes, eh, terciarizan, es decir, le compran, a los productores pequeños en los tiempos de cosecha, pero luego quedan abandonados a su suerte. Eh, así que no hay seguimiento de lo que ha sido, ni el impacto eh, en materia de empleo, en materia de eh, biodiversidad, de pérdida de bio biodiversidad eh, y de destrucción ambiental. Y que era importante de alguna manera esto que decía Teresa, eh, ver cómo se desarrolla la resistencia a la sociedad, y también se habló efectivamente de la falta de legitimidad eh, de estos acuerdos, porque no pasan por, por la voluntad popular a través de, de los sistemas ni representativos, ni tampoco de las voces de la sociedad civil. Gracias. To go with the third? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, we, ha we had uh, appointed somebody different, uh, some somebody else to do this, but <laughs> then we realized Martin couldn't be here on, on this on this uh, Zoom link, so it's okay. Um, we, yeah, we discussed more, maybe the, the questions were more related to the political process, so we discussed on the, uh, how the negotiations were um, carried on for the past 20 years. And uh, we talked about how the, the EU Mercosur negotiations were stopped at the same time the WTO in 2004 was stuck and also the FTAA, the ALCA negotiation with the US and the whole uh, American continent was also stuck, that was 2004. And then, although there were some negotiation, negotiating processes, only in 2012, they were uh, start, restarted again. And uh, it was due to the pressure of uh, the agribusiness sector in Brazil, especially. And at that moment, it was Argentina that actually kind of stopped the negotiations because of the red lines that were put there. And then what we, we talked about is how uh, the window of opportunity was with Bolsonaro and Macri, the, the two, Uh, presidents at the same time. And what we also were worried about is the future of the agreements, because one of the questions was related to that. And uh, I was saying, this is my hypo hypothesis, that uh, <laughs> actually we have uh, no clarity on the position of Lula da Silva 
what, what he, his position will be regarding this agreement, which is actually a problem because although everybody wants Lula da Silva to win, uh, all the progressive movements want Lula da Silva to win in Brazil, truth is that he has not been clear on the position regarding these agreements and the pressure from agribusiness in Brazil will again be huge. So um, it won't be the same for the European Commission and the European governments to negotiate with Lula or to negotiate with Bolsonaro. So there we have a social movement that oppose the, the agreement, we have a problem and we will have to rely uh, on, the, on the Brazilian movement and work a lot with Brazilian movement in the case uh, that Lula da Silva wins election because then we will have to be like, uh, have double care in that uh, different political context. So that is some of the things that we, we discussed in, in our group. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up as well, definitely. Um, so, I would um, like to thank everyone. I will try to do a little wrap up of what we have been discussing today. Um, so we have heard by Theresa that the economic and the political promises of free trade, the so-called free trade agreements are actually very flawed, that the huge industry groups are profiting the most from these agreements. Marita has highlighted this and also that they have the most direct influence on these agreements, which is a huge democratic problem. Um, the story of having an advantage in a certain production, as Theresa has pointed out, is le leading to, um, and I really like that, uh, Luciana, how you, uh, how you pinpointed that, is leading to locking in the asymmetric relations and locking in the extractivism that is guaranteeing the access to raw materials of, yeah, again, European companies, right? So that is a huge problem as well for the economic development in countries of the global south. Marita has said that, and that the higher reliance on this extractivist industry comes with many environmental and climate and human rights related problems. Also, we have heard that there is so many other parts and we could uh, possibly discuss for hours here that there's so many other parts to trade agreements like these unfair geographic uh, indications and so on. Um, let's keep it a little bit shorter here at this point. While this is a threat with the EU Mercosur agreement, so the agreement isn't in place yet, all these problems are a threat. We can see these problems having actually happened uh, in other agreements, for example, Ecuador, where an agreement is in place since six years. and. When it comes to alternatives, I think in trade, it is always a little bit different, uh, difficult. But as Marita said, one alternative is resistance to these agreements, to these uh, agreements that have been negotiated. And hopefully we can stop them, right? And on the other hand, regional production could be a solution. But of course, it has to be ecological and, and fair. Um, I'm sure we weren't able to answer all the uh, prevalent questions here in 90 minutes, but uh, here again, a warm invitation to everyone in the audience to get in contact with us, with the networks and the organi uh, organizations uh, that are uh, engaged in trade. If you have further questions, if you need information or speakers, um, I will also send a follow-up email to you um, on Ne uh, next week on Monday, it will include a couple of publications that can also help you to get deeper into the topic. So um, then I would like to thank everyone uh, for taking part here today at this warm afternoon and evening um, uh, uh, at this webinar. And of course, I want to thank a lot to, to uh, Theresa and to Luciana and Marita for taking part and giving inputs. I also would like to thank to the co-organizers and to my colleague uh, Lilian doing loads of work in the background and actually making this workshop possible. The last words I would like to pass on to our speakers today, if you have like uh, one minute of, of some words of hope and uh, empowerment for us, that would be wonderful. And for me, this is a goodbye. Thank you very much. Teresa, do you want to start? Um, yes, I go out with a lot of hope, actually. And I am especially a little bit sad, actually, that I'm not going to hear the person who's going to speak at the G7 summit um, next week. But uh, these are the kind of 
maybe little things that I wouldn't have known about if it weren't for today. Um, and like that, a lot of little things and bigger things are happening and we are going to build the resistance step by step, I think. <laughs> Thanks so much for organizing, Jeremy. Marita, do you want to continue? Sí. Sí. Eh, bueno, primero, muchas gracias. Como dijo Teresa, eh, he aprendido mucho eh, en el intercambio y, y creo que, que es muy importante eh, seguir escuchándonos como parte de una sociedad que resiste. Y sí creo en, en, en que se puede trabajar regionalmente y que sea ambientalmente sustentable y que, y que sea eh, siempre en cumplimiento de los derechos humanos y los derechos de los trabajadores y trabajadoras y de los pueblos eh, que habitan en, en cada uno de los territorios, ya sea en la Unión Europea como en el resto del mundo. Gracias. So my turn. Um, yeah, I would like to say for people, as this was an introductory uh, workshop also, is that as you have seen today, uh, trade agreements are much more than trade and impacts of trade agreements come on every different aspect of life and on every corner of the world because this is how capital is moving and has been moving for the past 30 years with these agreements. And what we see is that they refer to very, very unfair relationships between people. So what we have to do to go beyond this is to create alternatives as S2B uh, here has been working on documents. We have to start talking to people, explaining the politics behind the trade agreements and the importance of discussing them and the importance of discussing the alternatives to this because otherwise we won't have enough time in this crazy and collapsing world to change human relations and economic relations, uh, we have to start now. So this is good that we have to learn, but from there to take action. So that is a call to action to join Teresa and Marita here with, uh, with the same words. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Goodbye. <laughs>